Um, so we are in the last part of chapter eight. I know we talk a long time in chapter eight, but I think it's a very important chapter and it has a lot of spiritual benefits, maybe more of very theological benefits. Uh, and then the last part of the, um, the, the epistle, especially from chapter 11, 12, and 13, there will be, sorry, 12, 13, and 14, there will be a lot of like practical points. But this chapter, chapter eight, like I said, is more of the sanctuary of the, um, of the epistle. It's a, the kind of core of it. And it's, like I said, it's full of the word spirit. And that's why there's a lot of uh, messages in there. And I remember when we first started, I said that there are three main verses that the chapter is centered around. Verse one, which as you can see on the screen is talking about no condemnation uh, to those who are in Christ Jesus. So the, 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 the beginning, the introduction of the chapter talking about the life in spirit in Jesus Christ was to deny the condemnation. Then the center verse for it, when as if you're following the idea in the last couple of weeks, we're ascending like in a ladder of how much we're gaining from this life in Jesus Christ in the spirit. Until we reach the top when he will describe himself as firstborn among many present, like being brothers. And this is like a very high level. Imagine yourself talking about Jesus, like being firstborn among brethren, like him, like our firstborn, like brother. And we're like following him. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very strong, like high rank for us with him. Then it will conclude with the famous verse. We all know by heart who shall separate us from the love of Christ. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ladder going up until we reach this bondage of who will separate us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ. And we covered the first part of no condemnation. And we said that throughout this chapter, we are going step after step. The first gain, as we said in verse one, that there is no condemnation. We are free from condemnation. I don't want to repeat it because we already been through it for two weeks now. So I don't want to repeat it again. But in Christ Jesus, there are no condemnation. But he didn't say it like, oh, it's over. No condemnation and that's it. No, but he, he more of bound it with the fact that we have to walk according to the flesh. Again, like St. Paul's language, always about the synergy. What the spirit gave us, in what we have to do, what God is granting us, and what, what, what walking and working we have to do. And he was like, we're free, you know, we're free. We're free from the law of the sin, and we're free of the law of Moses, we're free of the law of death. And that was, if you still remember chapter 7, like the whole freedom from the law. That was the first gain. The second gain is that how we can die in Christ so we can rise up with him. So it's a process of death, as we described in chapter five in the through baptism and the daily death uh, pro process. When we went through verse five, we started to talk about swabbing things, switching things from what's in the flesh to what's in the spirit. So it's again, not only that we're uh, not condemned, not only that we're refraining from the life according to the flesh, but it has to be spirit by life according to the spirit. That took us a lot. And we, that would take us a lot of time and a lot of explanation. We're not going to repeat it again. But when he goes into verse 11, he gives us the fourth gain, which is enjoying resurrection in Jesus uh, Christ. Number five was how we owe the spirit. When he says that we, uh, in verse 12, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, but to the spirit. We do not do anything as if we're giving things out of ourselves, but it is more of, of a debt that we're paying back because we were already redeemed, we were bought by his blood. Number six, that we started to enjoy the sonship, that we are children of God, enjoying the sonship, enjoying being free from the bondage of the, of the sin into the freedom of the, um, the, the spirit. But here he will start to say, okay, how can we get this sonship? Well, it is through the spirit. He says in verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Without this spirit, we cannot, we dare not to stand up and say our father who art in heaven. We cannot. We cannot do that. We cannot say Abba Father, as he said in verse 15, and enjoy this adoption without the spirit. 
you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, and the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. It is through the spirit. And he didn't stop there, but he added one more thing. If we're children, well, we're heirs. And so this is number seven. So if six was being children, seven, that following being sons and daughters of him, we will enjoy the inheritance. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. And we talk about that bondage between God the Father, God the Son, and the inheritance that we uh, got. But he flipped upside down here. When he started talking about, oh, he is on top of being inheriting uh, what God gave us, all of a sudden, he started to put a new condition for his inheritance, saying, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified to get. If you want to get the inheritance of glory, if you want to get the inheritance in Jesus Christ of all this sonship, resurrection, and all these things, he put one single condition, which is the suffering, carrying the cross. And again, we said last time, it is mandatory for anyone who is following Christ to live in this, carrying his cross as Christ says. We will elaborate more about that, but just to summarize the idea that he put as a proof of his point, not only that we are following this path of suffering, but even the creation itself. And he gave this nice metaphor of a woman giving birth, same way that the whole creation is waiting to be freed uh, from this bondage of sin. And we explain how Adam was free before the fall. Then when he fell, not only himself and the whole humanity, but also the whole creation itself. And the same way it fell and it was like, you know, sub subjected to futility as like vanity, the same way it will be freed. Same way we were freed in Christ, same way the whole creation also. And we said that some of the fathers were talking about this creation as the universe. Some of the fathers were talking about the creation as the heavenly choir who rejoice when we repent. So we will be together in this joy. Some of the fathers like Irenaeus were talking about this creation is the flesh. In the same way, the flesh is now fasting and prayer and helping us, uh, helping us out in this work out of salvation. Same way, this flesh has to be also uh, redeemed, has to be also freed when uh, we get into the final resurrection. And I think this image of purse goes back to what Christ referred at as a woman is in labor. The same way we also in the world that we will also be freed uh, and we will also have the joy of a mother who's getting a new uh, child and this is that led us to the next point of how we can continue uh, this process of purse is through the hope through the hope he says we were saved in this hope a hope that is seen is not hope for why does one still hope for what he sees but if we hope for what we do not see we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So he talks more and more and more about the hope. And that will keep us in our track in this like gifts that we're talking. This is the only thing that can keep us in this suffering without falling in despair. The only thing that can keep us continuing in this life and that we can make us wait and be able to carry, you know, and endure this suffering is hope. And that's why we always like, we even give this, you know, a uh, nice joke always during Lent. You know, the only thing that keeps us continuing in Lent is the hope of, uh, you know, the feast and the hope of, you know, cutting the fast. Same thing, but definitely in a spiritual level. The only thing that keeps us in our life with all the suffering, with all the, you know, hardships that we're going through, even through all the asceticism, fasting and prayer and service and all these things that we, we work hard in our life, the only thing that can keep us continuing in this uh, asceticism and this, uh, you know, life is perseverance and hope. And I concluded last time by what St. Uh, Augustine says, that it's like an egg. The egg, when, what you see is only an egg. But what you believe that inside to hatch is, you know, something that you will get. And this, you know, thing is... In order for you to get it, it has to go through the worms and through the commitment of a chicken that, you know, lie on this egg. Same way in our life, it is, you know, this commitment 
of our spiritual striving and all the tribulation that we go through or all the cross that we carry is what can keep us in hope. So again, hope and perseverance, as he mentioned before. Okay, but through this journey of, you know, hardships or, or efforts and waiting for this, you know, hope, what can keep us sustained in our life? It is the spirit. And that's why he says, the spirit also helps our weaknesses. It helps our weaknesses. It is normal for us to feel weaknesses every now and then. It is part of our nature. It is normal for us. And we are in a week of temptation. So we have to understand that it is normal for us that sometimes you go through temptation. It is normal for us sometimes that we lose a little bit of hope, that we sometimes get like fainted, you know, in faith. It is normal for us to go through these hard times. And we have always to be ready for it. We have to always to predict that there will be times that we will not be sure about what we're doing. But the only thing that can keep us is the spirit. So the more we surrender ourselves to this spirit as child, as a child without power, without even, you know, without even strength to go through, the only thing we can do is just surrender ourselves to this uh, hope and surrender ourselves to this spirit that intercedes for us to the point that we cannot even know what to, what to pray. We do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I was reading something for St. Macarius, and I want to share it with you. St. Macarius of Egypt, uh, Amba Macarius, and he put it in a way, I really love it. He says, a small child is incapable of anything. It cannot even run to its mother on its own legs. Imagine, see a baby lying down on a bed, crying, doesn't even have the power to walk to his mom. It says it tumbles on the, he says it tumbles on the ground. You know, like a baby, cries out, subs, calls out for hair. The only thing that a baby can do is not to walk to his mom or to do any effort. The only thing is to do is just to call out to her. Then Sam Macarius continues and says, she, or like he's talking about the mother, is gentle with it, with the baby. She is touched to see her baby seeking her impatiently with so many subs. She goes to it overcome with love. She kisses it presses it to her heart, feeds it with unspeakable tenderness. Same way, God loves us, behaves like hair, like a mother towards the, the children that seeks him and cries out to him. He takes hold of our spirit, unites himself to it. This is what God do. And the, the rule that we have is the same way like a child. We don't expect ourselves to have power, to strive, to conquer, to win, to defeat enemy, we don't have this power. The only thing we can do is to pray, even if we do not understand what we're praying for. As St. Paul says here, even if we don't even know what to say, even if we're just going to stand up and raise our hands, raise our hearts, raise our eyes, and tell him, let it be according to your will and not according to my will. I don't know what to ask for. I don't know what to pray for. The only thing that I can do is just to sit there and lay down myself surrender myself to the spirit and the spirit will take care of it how the spirit will take care he continues and said the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered we don't understand it and like the, the, the you know the, the, the jesus said it is not with a measure that the spirit can give it's not measured and that, i said that a few times and i always repeat it we cannot just offer something like a prayer, fasting, and service and say, okay, we're waiting now for the reward. It's not working this way. It's not with a measure. Same way. It's not that, oh, we will fast and we will gain. Oh, we will pray and we will get. Well, it doesn't work this way. It's not a condition gift. It's not a condition relationship. Same way that God loves us unconditionally. Same way that we love our children unconditionally. Same way that the spirit will intercede for us unconditionally. The only thing he wants us to do is just to stand up and pray. And it says here, the groanings cannot be uttered. The groaning cannot be uttered. Here, I'll, I'll comment on some, some, you know, a couple of points. Number one, the word intercession here was repeated with many, you know, aspects. If you remember, he was talking earlier about the, how Christ intercedes for us. And now he's talking about the spirit interceding for us. And we also always in the church talk about the intercession of saints. So what is the difference? What is the difference between these uh, different kind of intercession. 
So, you know, it is in Christ that we, through his blood, get this acceptance. Uh, St. John said in his epistle, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have an advocate. One of the fathers says a great thing. He says that the key that can get us to the Father is the name of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why every single time we pray our Father who art in heaven, we end up with this, you know, with this seal in Christ Jesus our Lord. We do not have anything without this intercession of his blood. Number two, the spirit of, you know, the spirit intercession, as he says here, that the spirit will intercede for us. How? Well, Jesus said in John 16 in his prayer, the spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. He will take off what is mine and declare it to you. So you will say, oh, yeah, I stand up, I pray, and I got nothing. I sit down, I read my Bible, and I don't know really that, that much. I don't understand. Well, don't worry. Just don't worry. Just surrender yourself, and the Spirit will intercede. The Spirit will teach you how to pray. The Spirit will teach you how to read. The Spirit will teach us how to serve. The Spirit will teach us everything with these intercessions. But this, the saint intercession is a complete different thing. The saint intercession is not at the level of the Father or the Spirit. Because this is God himself. The saint's intercession is more of a prayer that, you know, someone is helping me with. It's a fellowship. Definitely, they have a higher level of inter intercession than our prayers to each other because they're, they made it already. They're in heaven already. They went through this, what we've been through, and now, they, you know, they, they're victorious now. But to put it at the same level of intercession like the you know, the intercession of God is definitely taking the, our Coptic Orthodox uh, understanding of intercession to a wrong understanding. And this is a very strong stumbling point when we talk with our, you know, Protestant brothers and sisters who always says, are you brave to St. Mary? Are you brave to St. No, we do not. No one dares for us to think that we pray to St. Mary. Of course not. The, what we do is to ask her prayers that she prays and, you know, that God will give us and that we always say that she pray for us, you know. And also we look at her, you know, way of life and we use her as a role model. So you have to make the difference between these two types of intercession. Then the last thing of, you know, not be uttered. It teaches a new language of talking with God because not every single prayer is audible. Not every single prayer is uttered. I remember I heard one time a sermon for uh, Bob Shinoud and he was talking about different kind of prayers. And he says, sometimes even, you know, raising your eyes is a prayer. Sometimes just, you know, like this kind of chronic thing is, is a prayer. Sometimes it's just like, you know, keeping yourself silent is a prayer. And this is what he says here. That these groanings cannot be uttered. Sometimes our prayers cannot even be uttered. But it is uttered, by, you know, it is understood by God. It is heard by God. And that's the difference between our conversations and whatever we offer to God in our prayers. Then in 27, he started to elaborate more about what it is really that we gain in prayer. Because this is the most common question. I, I remember we had two sessions with the servant meeting talking about what is the gain of prayer. If we're not going to change God's will, why do we pray? If we're not going to tell God, hey, you know, we want you to do, to do that, you know, change your, it's, it's a very, very kind of complicated discussion. And I know it's really hard. I don't want to go through it again. But um, back then we used some fathers, you know, quotes to, to kind of talk about what prayers. So one of it really that I like most saying prayer should not be used to change God's will, but to discover his will, then confirm our will to his. So the more we pray, the more we get closer to his well and understand his well in our life. So this is more of you know the rule of the spirit in our life and how it offer, how much does it really offer to us in our life. So here, St. Paul reached the top of what the spirit can give us. So from verse one until verse 27, we're talking about gains, gifts, and how much we get sonship, inheritance, intercession of the spirit, 
and resurrection and all these gifts. But like I said, he put it with the language of suffering. And now he will elaborate more what it means that we suffer and how we can live with this suffering. Because sometimes we lose hope. Why God allows these hard times? Why God allows, you know, hardship? Why do we have to go through like fasting and prayers? And like, why do you guys make it sound like very complicated and very hard? Well, this is what St. Paul is trying to do now. Let me read these few verses. I know it's a lot, but I will read the whole thing because I really feel that reading the whole you know, paragraph will make us understand where is he leading us to, where he is trying to take us. Let's read it. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are, call, who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of, his, of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we, all, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Let, it, let in all these things we are more than conqueror through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ, of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I know it's hard. I know it's very heavy. I know it's full of ideas. But what I wanted to say here, and that's why I insisted to read the whole thing, because he started by a very famous verse. We know that all things work together for, God, for good to those who love God. And he ended up talking about, oh, what is these things that work together? At the end, he started to count what does he really mean but those things that work together. When he says in verse 35, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, make all the bad things, then he even talked about the good spiritual things. Life, angels, principalities, power, things present or things to come. See, he mentioned things, good or bad. And he says, well, it doesn't really matter what we're going through. Because at the end, all things work together for good. All things work together for good to those who love God. This verse can take one session by itself. I'm not going to do that to you. Don't worry. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go through uh, like every single you know, word of it because it's really heavy. And this is more of a lifestyle. You know, if you, if you can put this verse on your door or in like write it down in a paper and stick it on the wall, you can just live according to this verse. And everything in our life will be different if we applied in, you know, this verse in our life. That all things work together for good to those who love God. Let's get just some, you know, thoughts about it. And I pray that we use it in our prayers over and over. Number one, we. He didn't say, you know, you should know that all things work together. No. He put himself as well. He put himself saying, we. Everyone who loves God knows very well that all things work together for good. So he started by putting himself because he didn't want to look like he's telling people what to do. You know, I'm now sitting on a seat and like preaching or giving a sermon or like, you know, talking about 
hardships and tribulations. And I also people talking about the cross is very easy. But once you get your hand in the experience of cross, oh, that's something different. I can sit down talking with someone who's going through like, you know, sickness, having like end stage cancer and sit down and preach to him how God love him and how this good, you know, works for good. But once I get in his place, that's a complete different experience. Talking about the cross is different than living the cross. So what Sam Paul wanted to do first is to say, hey, I'm not only talking to you or just like I'm giving a philosophy. No, I'm talking about something that I myself went through and I want to give you my experience. My personal experience is that all things work together. And who is more than St. Paul who went through hardships? Who is more than St. Paul who went through, like he described, you know, death every day. Every day he was seeing that. Every day that he's going through hard times. Every day he went through, you know, bad things in service. And he described himself, especially in the second Corinthians, the bad thing that he went through. That's number one. So first he put we. Number, thing, number two, he says everything, like I said, referring to what's going to come after, wherever, good or bad, wherever suffering, wherever even science and wonders and angels and principalities, and we all still be, you know, ourselves in service, don't get deceived by, you know, ah, you know, you prepared a lesson, and, you know, they're, they're, everyone was like, ah, oh, that's a nice sermon, or that's a nice talk, but we don't really get deceived with these things. That's not our goal. Even if someone show up, in a service, even if someone show up in a Bible study, even if someone show, show up in a class for Sunday school, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because that might be a life changing for only person. And one person is very precious to him. So everything, like he says here, good or bad, let's apply that to ourselves, good or bad. We have good days. We have bad days. We have things that we assume that they're good, but we're not sure that they're good. We have things that we assume that they're bad, but we're not sure if they're really bad. So it's really hard that we can stand up and pray for something and God, give me that. And the question, are you sure that this is good? Well, I don't think so. I don't think any one of us can be sure that yes, this is good. Even St. Paul himself, when he stood up and asked, he says, I asked God, I pleaded with the Lord three times that he gave him healing from what he was going through. And what God told him, my grace is sufficient for you, but my strength is made perfect in weakness. I don't want to give you the strength. I want to give you the weakness because my strength will be perfected in your weakness. And this verse is really hard. But the way I always uh, see it is like as if God is like, you know, full mighty power. And it has this, you know, key that you can just put in there to work. Definitely, that's theologically incorrect. But this weakness, as St. Paul says, it will make God's strength perfect. And this is God's humility. He's waiting for my own weakness to fulfill, to give, you know, the full picture of his perfection and his strength. So even St. Paul himself, one day asked for something and God told him, no, no, I don't think this is the best for you. I'm not going to give it to you. And that's St. Paul. So again, like I said, we're not really sure what's good or what's bad, but what we're sure, according to this rule that we read now, that they all will be for good. There's a very nice verse that I love in the end of one of the Psalms of the first hour in the Matin. The Psalm, I don't remember the beginning of the Psalm, but it ends by saying, The light is in your right hand forever. Al Bahagi fi yaminak ilal al qada. Every time I read this psalm, the light is in your right hand. As if God grasped the whole joy and delight in the world and he kept it in his hand. And he's like, the only place that you can get this delight or joy is in my right hand. You might think that there might be good things outside. But at the end of the day, I guarantee you, the only place that you will find your delight is in my right hand. So don't go far. Don't go away seeking any place else, assuming that it's good. Because what I'm telling you, that the only good thing is with me. Even if you think that it is bad, even if you think that it's hard, even if you think that's not the best for you, but I'm telling you, whatever you're going to go through will end up with good. And this is what happened with Job. Job assumed that he has everything. He's perfect in everything. 
And when God took everything from him, he started to sing, no, I was missing something. I had some problems and God fixed it to me. And even gave me more than what I had from before. That's good and bad. Success and failure. Sometimes we assume that the success that we have wherever we are is the only good thing. And sometimes God will say, you know what? Sometimes I will allow failure to happen to you. But definitely not going to be lazy and say, ah, we failed because God wants us to fail. <laughs> definitely that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that sometimes we do our best. We do every possible effort in somewhere and we end up seeing, ah, oh, it didn't work. Well, because God didn't see that this success in this specific thing is the best for you. Maybe he want to teach you a lesson. Maybe he want to take, you know, bride from you. Maybe you're distracted with a false goal that God want to take away from you. You never know. But at the end of the day, again, we apply the same rule here that all things work together for good. We will trust that what God has given us is the best. One more comment. I know that, I, you know, it's a lot to say here. I'll try to summarize as much as I can. But the word work together is one more point. You know, if he says that all things work for good, someone can stand up and says, no, cancer doesn't work for good. No, sickness doesn't work for good. No, you know, working hard doesn't look like working for good. We can put a lot of things and argue that it's not working for good. But when he put the word together, he made it look like a puzzle. One piece of it, might make no sense, might make no gain, might make no, you know, what are we gain? What is the good part? But it's like a puzzle. When you put all the pieces together, here you can look and say, yes, that is for good. Yes, that really for good. So again, when you read a story like Joseph, you look at him betrayed by his brother. What is good about that? Nothing. You look at him slave, what is good about that? Nothing. You look at the, him in the present, what is good about that? Nothing. But when you read the whole story, from the beginning till the end, you can see how all things work together. Because if it wasn't for the betrayal, if it wasn't for the slavery, if it wasn't for the present, he wouldn't be the savior. Savior of himself, savior of his family, savior of the whole world. He was even called Sifnat Fanih, which means the savior of the world. So it's definitely working together. But St. Paul also put something at the end of the verse. He said, for those who love God. For those who love God. It's hard, but it is the, the only condition that he put here. That we stain everything we see with the color of his love. Definitely, we do not start by loving him because he loved us first, as St. John says. Love will start from him. Then we will react by our love as well. And this is the proof that we are following him. That everyday language we do when we pray, when we read the Bible, when we serve, when you fast, when you do any act, this is to prove that you love him and only him. This is the most famous verse that we can read in the Bible, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Then he started to describe who are really those who love God. He gave few things. I'll put them together. Those who are the called according to his purpose. And because that sounds weird, does this mean that he has his own elect, like some people are teaching? Is it just, ah, yeah, God called some people according to his purpose, and that's it. You know, the rest are not welcome to this salvation, are not welcome for this good. They're not welcome for this love. He gave a following messages to explain what does it mean that he is, you know, are the called according to his purpose. And he put it in, again, kind of ladder form. He foreknew, he predestined, then he confirmed him to his image. And that will lead us all to be brothers with him. This is one of the most challenging verses, again, in our debate with the Protestants. Because they always claim that this verse means 
that God has his own choice and God has his own elect. That discussion will be verse uh, chapter 9, 10. I'm not going to go through it now because that will be the main discussion in the next couple of chapters. I'm not going to do that. But just to give a very short uh, message here, what does it mean that those who are called, actually it can be explained by filling, filling the planks by saying according to his purpose. I'll again put some theological point very quick here. If you didn't get it now, give us a chance until next chapter because we don't want to keep in chapter eight forever, but that will be repeated again. Number one, this calling is based on God's foreknowledge. So it looks like he have seen our story, our life story. And because the word purpose is like a very official language, like can be used in you know, legal terms in which, you know, like you interviewed someone, you look at all his resume, you know, what's, you know, what's his strong points, what he's good at, and so you can give him the job. Same thing. God saw our life by his foreknowledge, know exactly who going to make it and who going to be really, you know, truthfully called. That's number one. Number two, everyone is called. It was said, St. Paul said it, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So to claim that God has his own choice is really um, unfair, if I can say. Unless if we're going to add, again, like I said, that this choice, this calling is based on his foreknowledge. Yes, that can be theologically correct. But just to say that he has his own predestination, like some people teach, that's not even uh, fair. So number one, it's called purpose according to his purpose, based on the fact of his foreknowledge. Number two, the call is already for all. But who gonna respond? This is the question. Number three, this call is not a standard. God doesn't call everyone the same way. God doesn't call everyone the same way. No. When you see him, how he called Peter, how he called Matthew, how he called his disciples, this is different ways. Same way in our life. Some people God will call by richness. He'll give them a lot of gifts and that's how they're going to they gonna know him. Actually, some, sometimes people will do the opposite. God will do the opposite. He will call people by poverty, by need. And when they need him, they come back to him. Sometimes God will call us by good times. Some God, sometimes God will call us by hard times and so on. So again, the third message here that this call, so number one, the call is based on his foreknowledge. Number two, the call is for everyone. Number three, the call is not a standard one. It all depends, you know, on every one of us. Number four, that this call will depend on our response. How we're going to respond is what's really important. And when I was preparing for this point, the thing that really clicked to my mind was John 6. Remember when God was talking with him about the Eucharist and communion and his true body and, and, and he's talking about like, you know, those who are really close to him. He says, if you abide in my word and you are my disciples indeed. So he put here the word disciples and follow it by the word indeed. In this chapter, John 6, many of them, when they heard about the Eucharist, he says, no, this is hard saying. Who can understand it? And it said that from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So how do you call them disciples? But then call, ah, they walked with him no more. Well, they were not disciples indeed because they did not abide in his word. So yes, they were called, but they did not respond in the right way. And even when Jesus looked at his, you know, 12, and he says, you know, he, when Jesus said to the 12, you also want to go away? Then Peter looked at him and says, Lord, to whom shall we go? We have, you, you have the word of eternal life. There's no other place that we can go. This is the love of God that he was talking about here. This is how we can really see everything work was good, that we love him to the point that we can tell him with St. Paul, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So this is a divine call, and this is our response. And that one of the conditions of proving our love and that we're really following his, like following his call is that we do not complain. And I will, I will maybe conclude with this point here because and I wanted to read chapter uh, 10 of the first Corinthian, but I don't have time. So please read it tonight because it's talking about how the Israelites were called, right? They were God's nation. But he was in, in, in the chapter 10 of the first Corinthian, 
St. Paul is explaining how they're complaining with the reason why they lost this call, how they died in the wilderness, how that 99.9999 did not even enter the promised land. Only two people out of everyone who left uh, Egypt get into the promised land. Why? Because of the complaining. Because of the murmuring that you can read through the five books of Moses. Complaining, complaining, complaining. They never stopped complaining. Complaining about the food. Complaining about the, you know, the place. Complaining about the weather. Complaining about where to go. Complaining about the world of their mighty nation. Complaining, complaining. Every single day they would be complaining. And that's what sometimes make Moses like, ah, oh, God, did I even give purse to this nation? Just like, you know, take my soul. I don't want to live with them anymore. And God sometimes wanted even to, you know, like destroy them. And Moses would like, will intercede because of the complaining. And I'm afraid, my beloved, that we sometimes will be in the same place. We're complaining a lot, a lot about a lot of sins. Why God did allow that? Why God did I know that we sometimes feel stressed and I know it's not easy, but I mean, at the end of the day, if we love him, we trust him, we will not be in this place of complaining. For he who, for whom he foreknow, he also predestined to be comforted. So it's all, like I said, based on his foreknowledge. The word, his purpose, is to explain his plan. He has a plan. It's not just haphazardly happen. No, no. There is a plan for God. There is a plan for the foreknowledge, for the predestination, for even the confirming process of us to change us to the image of his son. And St. Paul here is great, is great. He never said anything that we should do. He's just like God foreknew, God predestined, God confirmed. Not to say that we have no rule to do, but of course to say that there is no proportion between what we can do and between what God is, has already done. See how much he did? He predestined, he confirmed, he gave us, you know, a lot, a lot. I was reading about the encounter that St. Paul, when he was Saul, had with Christ. And how when God called him, like, you know, you, you know, why are you persecuting me? The only thing that came out of St. Paul was, Lord, what do you want me to do? It's like, you know, I don't have any rights to, to, to take. I don't have anything even that I should, like, you know, I feel like I have anything that I have the right to take. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I, you know, I did a lot of bad things. But what was great about St. Paul is, not, oh, I'm bad. Oh, you know, I fell many times. Oh, that I need no sinner. But St. Paul was really, really looking forward. What do you want me to do? And this is the message that we have to do in every single confession. I come to God repenting and asking him, what do you want me to do? I don't want to keep elaborating about sins. You know what, Abuna, I did it because and because, you know, and did that. And she told me that and I answered back. And like, halas, just go ahead. What do you want me to do? Because God has a plan, like he told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. And we are sanctified. We are predestined. We are confirmed to be in his image. So the only thing we need to do is like asking him, what do you want us to do? Okay. So the connection here between the foreknowledge, predestination, and all this justification and glory is, has to do with us giving us you know, ourselves to him. And again, this process of change happens through pain, happens through carrying the cross. Remember when we were talking about like a mother giving first? Yes, this is the only way we can get a child. The joy of having a new baby happens only through this confirming, like and confirming this change is really through carrying the cross. And this is what we do in the Lent now. And this is why it's a gradual progress. That's why we don't have a standard, oh, you fast until sunset. It's like some people don't know. There is gradual. I was talking with the fellowship about the definition of ascetism in the Greek, the word eschesis is like training, like a sport man who work hard in his, you know, uh, workout to be a champion. You cannot do that in a day and a night. You have to keep working on it. The next word that can take forever for us to talk about is the word firstborn. And again, I don't want to give so much time because it's a very deep theological point. I don't want to go through it. But how does he consider like a firstborn? You know, he is the only begotten son. So even, you know, even like theologically speaking, he is in, in divinity. He is the firstborn because not that he has a beginning, like Arias said, but because he was begotten of the father. And this is the word homonogenes, the only begotten son. 
So it can be taken the you know in the divinity level that he's the firstborn, and in the definitely in you know in the in the in the flesh when we talk flesh he became the firstborn in many sense. He's the firstborn you know among the creation the firstborn uh, because he was the firstborn from the dead he was the name of Ulbakura Tarakajin the firstborn from that and that he went through everything he wants us to go through. He was baptized because he wants us to get baptized. He was he fasted because he wants us to fast. He was tempted during this, you know, fast because he also allowed us to go through temptation. And like I said, it gave us more dimension and horizon our relationship with him. And again, is justification and glory and so on. But not to feel scared, he added here and says, then shall we say to these things, if God is for us, who can be against us? Don't be scared. Don't worry. Don't worry. What we have is more what, what's against us. Then he said one of the, my favorite verses in the whole Bible. This is one of the, my favorite verses, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but deliver him up for us all, how shall we not with him also freely give us all sin? Again, if he did not spare his own son, but deliver him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all sins? Eyes eating. What do you want more? <laughs> what do you more to ask for? What do you what you really asking more? If God gave us himself, he gave us him, his only begotten son on the cross, that he died for us. How dare we think that there is something more precious that we should ask or we doubt about that God will not give it for us. And when he says his language, that he did not spare his son, all the fathers, when we talked about this verse, went back to the story of Abraham and Isaac. Exactly the same word, sparing his son. When God saw Abraham willing to offer his son, let me read what he said in Genesis 22. He says, by myself, I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son. You did not spare your son, your only son. He gave him all the rewards. He says, blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies and so on. He keep giving him blessings. I want you to put this equation same way here, same way that Abraham did not spare and gave, and the reward was taking all the blessing, same way that God did not spare his only begotten son, offered him as a sacrifice to redeem us, and same way he is willing to give us all the blessing. He says, give us freely all things, but not the physical, you know, flesh, carnal things, because if it's according to his will, he will definitely give it us. But if it's not, it will be not again. It's going to be a loss that we will do. And here there is a very nice quote for St. John Chrysostom. I'll read it for you. I don't have time to you know, elaborate more about it, but I'll just read it. He says, quote, If God gave the greatest things to his enemies, wouldn't he give the lesser things to his friends again? If God gave the greatest things to his enemies, because he died for even his enemies, wouldn't he give the lesser things, these earthly things, these, you know, like things that we're keeping our mind busy with, to his friends, to his children? Definitely he will. Then the last part is more of an argument. There's like disapproving questions, you know, there's like disapproving questions. Ah, it's impossible to happen. What? He says, who is he, you know, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Who dare? Who shall condemn? You know, who, who is he who condemns? The number three, who shall separate us? He's like, that's like denying these things. That would never happen. It would never happen that anyone can get, bring charge against God's elect. Who? No one dares. And even the one who dares, devil, will be thrown in this, you know, in this, uh, the end, he will be cast down. And this is exactly the same word that was book, uh, mentioned in the book of Revelation. Who shall bring a charge 
I was reading in, uh, in Revelation, if I'm not mistaken, 12, he says that this, you know, the, the accuser, that God will throw this accuser who deceived the whole world. He says, salvation, strength, and kingdom of God and the power of Christ. He says, for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. So this is a final condemnation for the accuser. So no one dare accuse against us. Yes, he can tempt us, like we're going to see in the gospel of this weekend, uh, Sunday, the, 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 you know, the gospel of temptation. Yes, he can tempt us, but he cannot. He can accuse, like he says, you know, day and night, but he cannot dare to win. And he, later on, he will be talking about the victorious language that we're going to get in him. So who can accuse? It is God who justifies. So don't worry about it. It's in God's hand. Number two, who condemns? Who condemns? If God is the one who's going to judge the world, why would we be scared? If you're going to be on his side, like he said earlier, didn't he say if God is with, for us, who can be against us? Well, if you're on God's side and God is the one who's going to judge, who's going to condemn, don't worry. There is no condemnation whatsoever. As he said at the beginning of the chapter, for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's like cover yourself with Christ and be with him and you're good. There are no condemnation, like he says. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, furthermore also risen, who is at, even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. He will intercede for us. He will get us in heaven, just be in his side, be with him day and night. Number three, who shall separate us from God? Nothing, nothing. And he gave a list of hardship that we can go through. I actually had like linguistically prepared definition for all these words, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, but I don't want to go so much like into this kind of philosophical uh, deep meaning of this word because they're, they're different. Tribulation is not the same like distress, not like the persecution. But at the end of the day, they're all hard times that we're all go going through. But at the end, he says, it is also written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Same way that he was counted as a sheep for slaughter. Same way he allows his children also sometimes to go through that. But the gain is, and please memorize this verse, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Not only that we're going to be victorious, not only that we're going to conquer, no. He says here, more than conquerors. Because those who conquer are victorious in a daily language, those who suffer, and they also count, you know, how much did they lose? You know, when you have a war, you count how many you know, soldiers you lost, how many equipment you lost. But those who are in Christ are not only conquerors, they're more than conquerors because it is him who guarantee this winning. And he started to talk about all these things. Maybe St. Paul is enjoying these things. I personally not. When he talks about the angels, the principalities, and the, you know, uh, the powers and things, presence, nor things to come, he says, you know what, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other created things shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Even if sometimes it looks like, you know, spiritual things, don't distract yourself. And I always tell myself, don't distract yourself with these things. Keep the love of Christ is the thing to abide in who shall separate us from him. May God give us through this journey of the land to get closer in him, to attach ourselves in him and be one with him, not to be separated ever. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Um, I